Have you ever met someone, and you probably have in South Auckland, um, have you ever met someone with just a really funny name? You know, you just meet someone and you're like, hi, I'm uh, Bruce or Raymond. You know, you've got a normal name. You ask them, what's your name? And they say something and you're just like, what? <laughs> what, what have you heard? I see you're nodding. What have you heard out there? Interesting names, that's right. We don't want to make fun of them because these are real people, aren't they? What have you heard? Um, on YouTube? On YouTube, okay, yeah, yep. I saw, I saw some, I, I and there was funny names. Yeah. Harry, not Harry. No, no, Her- Harry. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I'll share with you one, and I have, I have permission here because this is my cousin. So I'm from Gisborne. My cousins are from Gisborne. <sighs> uh, so my cousin's family are, are the Walkers. That's what their names are, Walker. And they decided to name their son Anakin Sky. I tell you, I, <laughs> right. Now, we can't make fun of people's names because every time you, you go through life, sometimes a lot of these names have a, have a strong her- history, right? Anakin Skywalker has a great, great 40 years of heritage behind it. Uh, <laughs> Harry, who knows? It probably means strong or noble in whatever language they came from, uh, I hope. But sometimes when we're reading Bible... We come across some of these funny names. And just like these real people we meet, Anakin, Sky, and Harry, and uh, your friends from class, <clears throat> we have to dig deeper <laughs> and we have to understand there's more going on here than just a name, even if it sounds a bit funny to our ears. Because I'm sure some people think our names are funny. <sighs> well, let's pray for these people and their names. Lord God, we um, pray for the people that were uh, mentioned in this children's talk. Lord, um, we don't know where they are, but you do. Lord, we pray wherever they are that you would reveal yourself to them in a powerful way. Uh, Lord, we pray, Lord, that they would have a friend who's a Christian and that they would be invited along to a church where they would hear your gospel. And we pray that you would raise them up as uh, your children and teach them diligently to do good works. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So on your order of services, you'll see that the sermon text today says uh, Titus 3, verses 12 and 13, sermon titled Christ's General. Um, That is not what we will be hearing this morning. Needless to say, it was a chaotic time in the downstairs library at GTC this week. Uh, (laughs) It was wild. Um, Our text today will be Titus 3, verses 12, all the way through to the end, to 15. Um, And the sermon title will uh, reveal itself in the preaching. Let us come before God's word. Uh, one last time in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that by it, uh, people are brought to life as they uh, come to know your son Jesus and they come to know you through him. Lord God, we pray Uh, that your word will uh, speak forward with power. Lord, we pray that you would attend the preaching of your word this evening as you have done uh, on so many other occasions uh, for 2,000 years, Lord. And we pray that you'd speak to us tonight, that the deficiencies in the preacher would diminish and uh, your excellency would shine. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus and uh, in the power of his spirit. Amen. So we've made it. We've made it to the end of the book of Titus. 
it seems like it was about six months ago that we started and the pace that we took one verse at a time I was thinking that we would we were going to be in Titus for uh, well I thought thought it would take a, a bit longer but here we are and uh, here we are on our final part of Titus uh, and and we'll see that at first we're confronted with a few names, but upon digging, upon inspection, we'll see that what we have here is a window into Paul's church, into the earliest apostolic church. So let us read this passage, verses 12 to 15. Uh, maybe for context, we will begin at verse 4. And we will pray that God will give us that glimpse into his church and even more, a glimpse into his heart and his plan for salvation. So let's read, starting at verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Now preaching portion this evening. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. And all who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. And that is the end of the book of Titus. The ESV has entitled it Final Instructions and Greetings. And if you're anything like me, when you start seeing names like this and you know that you're at the end of an epistle, you start thinking, oh, I've read this a bunch of times. Every epistle ends this way. It's just greet, greet Prisca and, and greet uh, Thomas and greet so-and-so. And, -so. and, uh, and you sort of start to look over it. Like you get to the end of your, your, your emails from, from management and it starts to say, oh, nah, mehi, Brenda, don't share this email. It's confidential. You start, okay, okay, I'm not going to read all of this. But we understand that every line of scripture is God-breathed. And that shouldn't be our starting argument, but, but it, is, it is our solid bedrock. That every line of scripture is God-breathed, and therefore what? Profitable for correction, reproof, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. So we've got these names we're confronted with. Artemis. Tychicus, this place called Nicopolis, these two men called Zenos the lawyer, and Apollos. And Paul is uh, <clears throat> eager to tell Titus that these men are important, that they are to be cared for, that they are to be given everything that they might need. And Artemis... Well, he's the easiest guy to tell you about because we don't know anything about him. <coughs> he's, there's the easy one out of the way. Um, we know that his uh, 
name is the male form of Artemis, which is the Greek goddess of the hunt and every girl's first D&D character. And, uh, no, no. Um, but he, we know that he, he is here and that Paul wants him equipped. Tychicus, we have a little bit more. We have a little bit more from Tychicus. Tychicus is mentioned in a few passages at the end of the book of Ephesians. We see this person, Tychicus, and we'll see. I'll just flip over and I'll stand in the way of the fan. This person, Tychicus, is mentioned by Paul. At the end of the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, he says this, So that you may also know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, here he is, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Tychicus is also mentioned at the end of the book of Colossians. Final greetings, Colossians 4, chapter 7. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother. There's that one again. Wouldn't it be nice in, to be mentioned twice in Scripture as a beloved brother? and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, a fellow slave, just like Paul. You know how Paul calls himself a slave, a picture of lowness, but, but highness too, because he's a picture, he's, a, he's not just a slave, he's a slave of someone who has great power and authority, a slave of the Lord, the one who goes about his work and his bidding. So he's a brother a faithful minister, fellow slave. Uh, Paul has sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. There it is again in Ephesians and again in Colossians. This man called Tychicus travels to churches, probably even bearing the first handwritten copy of these letters to, to tell them about Paul, about what he's doing, about uh, ministry exploits, um, to minister the gospel to them and to encourage their hearts. That's who this man Tychicus is. The third name in the book of Titus is someone who, like Artemis, we don't know much about, but we do know a little bit more than Artemis. It's this man in verse 13, Zenas, the lawyer. We know two things about him, his name and his occupation. What we have here is a glimpse. We have a glimpse of, of a man who has come along with these men, part of Paul's ministry team, the likes of Artemis, the likes of Tychicus, but this man is a lawyer. Could be incidental, could be a sober foreshadowing, of problems that might come down the line when a minister needs a lawyer certainly won't be the last minister of the gospel to need a lawyer certainly wasn't the first and the last man Apollos is the one who we know a, a, a bit more about Apollos is a man who we've met before if we've gone through the book of Acts we uh, come across him in the book of Acts in chapter 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 24. There's a passage here where it tells us who he is and what he does and what he's like. Uh, you can uh, go there if you want, but, but you can hear me say uh, what it says here in Acts 18, verses 24 onwards. It says, now a Jew named Apollos a native of Alexandria. Um, Alexandria was a city in the northern coast of Egypt. Big city, big city, important city. Now this man, a Jew from Alexandria, came to Ephesus, which was in Turkey, what we call Turkey now. Um, they called it Asia. Um, 
which which then became the name, you know, the even more Asia. That's how we get the name for all everything that's that way, is is from this small place in Turkey called Asia. Um, he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He's a man of skill, a man of verbal skill, a man of of intelligence. He knew the scriptures, and he knew how to speak about them accurately. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So he was a man who was preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel well. There was some deficiency in the gospel he preached, some deficiency that was related to how the old way now, now it becomes the new way, how the way of John is, is now passed as the last Old Testament prophet, and now we have this new way of Christ. But he received instruction, and he went back and, and adjusted himself. He pivoted, which is something um, which, is, uh, which is something which is incredibly valuable in a teacher. It's humility to admit when you're wrong and to adjust, to change, and to grow. From there, he went across to Achaia, which is in Greece. Uh, the brothers in Ephesus encouraged him, and they wrote ahead of him to vouch for him, to say, this is a good man, receive him well, feed him, um, listen to him. Uh, and when he arrived in Achaia, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. So this Apollos is the one we know a bit more about. So a skilled man, uh, corrected himself, humble, great student, great teacher, goes to Greece, teaches the gospel powerfully from the scriptures to the Jews. We know later on, we hear in, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians that he was so good, there was a little bit of that dissensioning happening that Jeff McPherson was talking about this morning. Some people said they love Apollos so much they like him better than Paul. And some people were saying, no, we're with Paul, no, we're with Apollos. And then the super spiritual guys were like, we're with Jesus. Um, yuck. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, but this is 10 years in the past now. This is Corinthians was a while ago. This is 10 years later of past, we believe. And Apollos is now part of this new mission, which um, he is traveling with Zenos the lawyer um, through Crete on to somewhere else. And Paul is eager <clears throat> to, tell Timoth uh, to tell Titus that Apollos and... Uh, and Zenus, the lawyer, are to be received as brothers, to be fed, to be given everything they need so that they would lack nothing. Let me get my place here. So we've got a picture starting to form of who these men are, these kind of men that are moving through these, this old, this, this old uh, New Covenant church, is that these are men who are encouraging. These are men who teach the gospel. These are men who uh, are competent in preaching the gospel. They're, they're, they're competent in, in reasoning from the scriptures uh, and explaining to people that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, they can do it. They can do it to Greeks. They can do it to Jews. Um, they are seasoned preachers. And more than just teachers, you know, these men are... Uh, encouraging their brothers they're not just smart but they encourage the heart these are real preachers these are real ministers of the gospel the kind of men that titus had been tasked with finding and these men well they've got two things one they've got a great giftedness and the second thing they've got is this great thing which we call authenticity. Now, if you're anything like me, 
uh, you, you might cringe when you hear the word authenticity because I, I don't know if you've read the same things I've read, but it's sort of done to death where you sort of, uh, people are told uh, authenticity is about sharing yourself, warts and all, telling everyone every bad thing you've ever done, oversharing, and it's say, well, that's okay. That's just me being my authentic self. Just, you know, even just sinning in public, being, you know, just not afraid to be sloppy. Um, these guys are, are authentic in the true sense. Authenticity means that, that the things they speak correspond with the reality that's going on in their heart. They're saying things and, and they're not acting. They're not pretending. They're saying that once upon a time, I was a sinner, I was lost, until the grace of God was revealed to me, and I knew Christ. And everything I tried to put my hope in, in this world, was revealed to me to be shallow, more than shallow, that only got me into even deeper trouble. In fact, it was loaded with sin, which I knew would lead to death. These guys that live that reality... Now, why is it so important that, that these guys, these, these Artemises and Tychicus, these, these gifted, authentic gospel ministers, are, are received well, treated well, and, and passed on? You know, sometimes in our culture, we sort of treat, treat preachers a little, bit, a little bit less than, you know, like we love Logan Hargort, but then one day Joel Beakey comes and he's at a conference and we think, oh, forget about Logan, let's go see Joel Beakey. He's a great, uh, great theologian, decided to leave his office to lead a conference. Let's go and pay our money to him. These guys treated their preachers the way we treat theologians, right? The way we treat these traveling theologians. They're received and they are given everything that they need because the ministry that they are engaged in is so important. And what is that ministry? Well, let's go back to Titus chapter 1. This is where we're getting the overview of the book of Titus. Chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Paul explained to us why preaching is so important. He explains to us what this ministry is that the church has been told to do. He says, Paul, a servant of God, that's who's writing the letter, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, here is his purpose. For the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised beforehand, uh, before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Why is preaching so important to Titus? Why is it so important that these preachers come and are received? Because according to Paul, and according to the book of Titus, preaching at, at, at this, somebody standing here and reading the Bible and explaining it to you is the most important thing that you can hear. It is salvation. It is God bringing people to faith manifesting the promises that he has had from before the world began, promises which extend here and now and into eternity, are coming here and being manifested through preaching. This is, this is, Titus's, this is Titus's method for mission. I d I've done a mission paper this, this semester, and um, mission... You know, we know what missions are, right? We've heard of them. It's when people go, they take the gospel to somewhere else that doesn't have the gospel yet and tells them the gospel so that they can come to faith. Brother Ejimar is a missionary because he's not from here. He's a minister and he's here and he's, and he's going to preach the gospel here. And I've been reading these textbooks that just overcomplicate the matter so much. Jeff is nodding. <clears throat> Books about worldview, books about understanding these people, where are they coming from, where, what do they believe in, what are, what are their hopes, how do they make their money, what, what did their ancestors believe. Um, 
you know, recent political movements in their countries? How does that affect their, their receptiveness to the gospel? How do, we, how do we change and pivot the way we present these truths so that we can strike the arrow and hit it every time? How to, how to, how to contextualize the gospel? Paul says here that you preach the word. That's our mission. That's our mission method. You preach the word. And he says, through the preaching of the word, the promises of God, of eternal life, hope beyond the grave, are manifested here in the lives of those elect who hear and come to faith. That's the promise. It's not in wild strategies. It's in pulpit gospel ministry. And so it's important here to see that the reason why Titus, the reason why Paul wants Titus to tell the people of Crete to treat these traveling gospel preachers with such great um, importance and, and to provide for them for their every need is because this ministry is the most important thing in the world. It is the difference between life and death, more than, more than death. It's it's the, it's the difference between an eternity in hell and an eternity at God's side. It is the most important thing that anyone can, can devote their resources to, is to receiving men like Zenus the lawyer and Apollos. And he says this, do your best to speed them on their way. See that they lack nothing. You know, this is more than just, you know, pick them up, show them around town for the day, drop them off at the airport. You know, this is more than that. This is, this is an island called Crete, which is full of wicked, evil, lazy, gluttons, wicked people, right? In the middle of the, in the, middle of the Mediterranean Sea, which is a place which is just... You know, the, the wind from the desert, right? It comes off it, it hits it, it turns it into a cyclone, destroys ships. We've seen it in, in the book of Acts where Paul is on a ship, right? He gets shipwrecked, he ends up in Malta. It's in the middle of the Roman Empire, which even though they keep the cities safe, there's still bandits and brigands on every road, which we know because of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? We know there are bandits on the road. We know there are pirates in the water. We know that when somebody, when Paul tells you to see that these people lack nothing, it, it, means, it means really see that they lack nothing. It means don't wait for them to tell you, oh, you know, I've got this hole in my shoe. It's no, you ask. You ask, are you okay? Do you need clothes? Do you need dental? Do you need um, traveling food? Do you need money? Do you need safe passage? Do you need a, a place to stay? I know someone on the other side of the island. It really is to, to devote yourself and to be proactive in serving these people because of the importance of their ministry. He says this, <clears throat> do your best to speed Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their way, see that they lack nothing. And even more than that, he says, he says, don't leave to see me until Artemis and Tychicus come to you. He says, he says, you can come to me, but you wait because you don't want to leave Crete without a preacher. The most important thing you could do is to make sure there's a preacher in Crete before you leave. Everything that Paul is telling them to do is putting this, this vision of ministry from, from Titus 1, 1 to 3 into practice. So preaching is the most important thing to, to, to Paul. And he's instilling this in this church in Crete that, that by hook or by crook, you make sure that this pulpit stays full. You make sure that other pulpits stay full. You make sure that this preaching ministry continues. It bears repeating. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. 
So we've got this great specific example of, of things that the church should be doing, which is um, giving our resources to ministers, making sure they arrive safely, making sure they're equipped. Uh, generally speaking, now, we'll take a step back and think generally, Paul is telling the people to uh, learn to devote yourself to good works, to learn with your mind how to cultivate and instill and feed this devotion in the heart to good works, which you then actively do, not just thinking about good works, not just wanting to do good works, but then putting that thought and that, and that desire into practice by working out these good works. This is how Christians are to, are to be. We are to be thinking, desiring, and doing these great good works. Now, why? We've had plenty of sermons on good works. We've had a few specifically on good works in recent, recently, but, but all of chapter 2 is devoted to good works. You see how Paul tells, he's telling us, and, and we had all these sermons that were saying, um, older women show the younger women how, how to live and, and how, to, how to work in their family. Uh, older men show younger men how to be self-controlled, how to, how to cultivate this desire and this, this discipline for good works. And we see what well, this, this isn't divorced from the gospel ministry. In fact, this, this is an integral part of the gospel ministry. Why? Because in, in chapter 2, when we look back, we see that all of these exhortations to good works are bookended by these reasons for good works. We do good works because they're good. It feels good to do them sometimes. Sometimes you do a good work, it feels bad. But there is a purpose to the good work. In verse 5, right, it says... Uh, uh, so train the young women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands. Reason, verse 5, that the word of God may not be reviled. See, it's this authenticity principle. This principle of authenticity, which we expect in our pastors and in our preachers, that when they speak, that there, there should be a heart there that matches it. There should be the real thing. This principle of authenticity is extended to the entire community where the people are expected to be good and to do good works, which God commands them to, because it, it adds credence to the, to the gospel that is preached. Paul says it again when he talks to the bond servants. He says, bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, an adornment. So we see that these two commandments, which is care for the ministers, pray for the ministers, give them what they need so they can teach, is augmented and buffered by this general call that everyone should be devoting themselves to good works because that good works serve to add credibility and power to the gospel preaching. Now, I'm not saying it adds to the power of the Holy Spirit, but I am saying that the gospel presentation is one that happens from one mind to another mind. You people are humans. You, you, you weigh things up. When you hear somebody tell you, give everything, surrender all to Jesus Christ, well, you want to know that that's legit. And you, and, and you shouldn't be blamed for that, right? It's, it's the biggest call you can ever make is to give your life to Christ. And Christians and pastors and people in the seats need to know that when we call to the lost, that we can show them the respect by demonstrating that the things we're preaching and the things we're believing in actually have the power to make these changes that, that, that we say they do. 
that we, that we are transformed people, that we do bear fruit. We were uh, dead. We were blind. But now we are alive. Now we can see. This call for holiness is, is intricately connected. It's this vision of ministry, holiness in the church, the gospel in the pulpit. And 15, all who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. <clears throat> Paul ends with grace be with you all. Because he knows, and we know, that none of this can be done without God's grace. None of this can be done in our power. Salvation was never something that any of us, that any of us accomplished. It was Christ that accomplished it by grace. That growth in holiness, that growth in desire to do good works, it's something that we can't cultivate. It's grace. We need to pray for this. We need to pray for this change in the spirit because we lack the inclination. We lack the power. But when Paul says in verse, uh, verses 4 onwards that when the grace and goodness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ. Now, if we know that our salvation comes by grace, through this rich pouring of the Holy Spirit, from the grace of God, through Christ. How can we not but confidently pray to our Father? How can we not pray? Glory to your name. Bring your kingdom to earth now. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in our lives. May we grow in obedience. And if that is our prayer, and if that is our prayer to God, then how will he not provide us with everything we need to fund the ministry? I'll leave you with a quote from Hudson Taylor via Tony Bracefield. He says this. He says, God's work done God's way will never lack provision. That's a Tony Bracefield quote. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would glorify yourself in our church. Lord, we pray that you would use our pulpit and use our our gospel ministry, our preachers, uh, that you would use them powerfully. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, provide us with everything uh, that, that that our gospel preachers need. Lord, we pray we wouldn't wait for them to ask, but that we would uh, seek to serve them. Lord God, we pray that the gospel will go forward through the ministries of Logan and Jeff, Ejimar, uh, uh, Jeff Usatich. And Lord, we pray that you would bring many, uh, that you would bring many lost souls out of darkness through their word. Lord, we uh, pray also for the good works and holiness of the people of covenant. Lord, we pray that they would be known as a church who love God and love doing what's right. And we pray that when we receive glory, that we would give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.